this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggle 66 Hour of the Truth in collaboration. Once again, yes, once again, wonderfully, we have found via Skype each other, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and me, to do the next reading of this wonderful book from Steve Wahlberg, picture, 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 The End Time Delusions. We are still in chapter, if I'm not mistaken, 21, I always get this chapter screwed up. It's the last but one in section three of the book. It is called The Path of the Virus. Of course, that's a name that is very fittingly for the time we live in today in 2021. But we are not speaking about the virus that is planted or come or whatever in the world that shakes up the world today, especially the world of unbelievers who have nothing to hang on to. We at least have the Bible to hang on to. We know all these things are coming and we know who does all these things and the world doesn't. But this is about the virus of futurism that is planted into the brains, even the study and brains of the Bible of Protestants, of quote unquote Christians who proclaim the Bible and the Bible alone, but then they go into the churches and uh, because they seek fellowship and in the churches they are betrayed by their pastors that have been educated in Jesuitical seminaries like uh, Dallas, um, I always forget the name, the D Dallas, Dallas Theological Seminary. Theological thing. I, I thought it was DTS. Yeah, Dallas Theological Seminary. I just couldn't get the words together. Thank you, Tom, for falling in there. Um, which is the biggest uh, futurist school, to my knowledge, in the United States of America. And we probably have those all over the world. And wherever you go to seek fellowship and like-minded, when you started reading the Bible, and then you want to go into the church and find confirmation of that, all of a sudden they teach a completely different story in that church. And our brother in Christ, Steve Wahlberg, sat down for a certain amount of time 
and read a few books that then later on he put together in one book that is called End Time Delusions. And we are reading about that. And last time I announced already that we are going to finish that chapter and then go to the last chapter of that section before we take another course in this reading. That's about a later time to explain what that is. But of course we didn't make it. Because sometimes I say, oh, let's go through this chapter. It's only two pages left, and then we read two sentences. Because it is so interesting to um, give people extra information on the understanding that most of all Tom has about the futurist deception that is in the people. And that's why we get not really distracted, but we get so deep into the subject that we don't even need Steve Wahlberg's book. We do um, our addressing of the subject on the people by ourselves without any help and especially Tom does it and that's why I want to call Tom to the table today to the microphone and do with me the 54th reading of this End Time Delusions book. Hello Tom and welcome to the broadcast. Yes, yes. hello Yerk and the listeners too as well. I'm very pleased and happy and, and uh, blessed to be here and uh, I'm going to continue the thought that you were making earlier about uh, about the virus. You know, this chapter is entitled what now? What was the title of the, of the, of the book that we're in? The title of the chapter? The Path of this, the Virus. The Path of the Virus. Yeah. Uh, obviously a, a reference to futurism. And uh, the comment that I would like to make in, in those regards is uh, let's get our heads on straight. The virus that the world is so uh, in uh, so worried about today is called COVID-19. But COVID-19 can only kill the body. Futurism, that virus that we're speaking of in this book, can kill the soul. Okay? So which should we fear? That which can kill the body or that which can kill the soul? And... Uh, that's the one that I'm worried about, futurism, the virus called futurism that has single-handedly destroyed the Protestant Reformation. I mean, uh, I was accused earlier today of being like Elijah, thinking that I'm the only one left alive uh, to tell the truth. And then God hastily reminded Elijah, you're not the only one. There are yet 7,000 in Israel who have not yet bent the knee to Baal. Well, uh, I would just ask the listeners, uh, if there are 7,000 historicists left in the world, praise God's holy name. But how many historicists do you know? How many historicists can you name? How many historicist churches are you aware of that exist in the world? Not just in the United States, but anywhere in the world. How many theological seminaries do you know that are historicist? Not a single one. Yerk mentioned Dallas Theological Seminary as being a futurist, a purveyor of this virus. And he's absolutely correct. But even more than that, they're all futurists, without exception. There are no historicist theological seminaries in this country, or for that matter, around the world that I'm aware of. Now, somebody can mock and say, well, Tom's just running off at the mouth like Elijah did, saying that he's the only historicist left in Israel to tell the truth. And God might well say, well, yet, Tom, there are yet 7,000 in Israel that have not yet bent the knee to Baal. And he's probably right. But I don't know any. I know Yerk. I know Steve Wolberg. I know a few handful of others, but certainly they are not a voice to be heard in the world. You don't hear them on YouTube. They're like finding a needle in a haystack. And those that are truly historicist in their interpretation of Bible prophecy and know the truth, 
number one, who is the Antichrist in the world? They keep it to themselves. They're fearful because they know that Rome rules every nation. Every government of every nation in this world serves the man of sin in Rome. And if that seems outrageous, all you got to do is go to YouTube. All you got to do is go to uh, Wikipedia and see how many concordats the papacy has with the governing bodies of the world's nations. How many concordats, how many legally binding agreements are signed by the nations of the world to serve the papacy and to make Roman Catholicism the nation's religion? How many nations of the world pay homage to the man of sin in Rome by going to the Vatican in sackcloth and ash and bend a knee before him and kiss his slippered toe, if not his ring? They all do. Even the president of Russia, Putin, made his dutiful trip to the Vatican to take his marching orders from the king of kings and the lord of lords of this world, the papacy. Now, for every human being that would tell me that uh, the papacy has no power, is just a doddering old fool in the world. The Vatican's only 108 acres. They're poor. They're always banging their, their cup uh, for, for donations. Is simply ignorant of the facts. Now, I can forgive ignorance, but only for a time. And uh, I was ignorant for most of my life, and I'm not ignorant anymore. And I want to pass the wisdom that I've learned to anybody that is willing to accept the truth, the visible, palpable, inarguable truth in this world. The papacy rules over the kings of the world. And the one one book that proves that more than all the other books that I've read on Inquisition Update over the last decade is the book by the Knight of Malta known as uh, 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 the name escapes me right off the bat. The book is uh, Francis Rooney, uh, Tom. Global Fra Fra Vatican. Fra Fra I'm, yes, the Global Vatican by Francis Rooney. And I get it. I, I, I just... Uh, Plead with the listeners, find a recording of that reading and discussion of that book, and you will know, just as I do, how much power the Vatican wields over the kingdoms of this world. And uh, you'll see it for yourself by a, a Roman Catholic Vatican insider and a Knight of Malta. Tells you secrets that you would never comprehend unless it was in print. And you can see it for yourself. The Global Vatican by Francis Rooney. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. It, it took you 99 sessions to get through that book. And uh, I have uploaded all these parts uh, to the great spite of uh, Mr. Nicholas Arthur from First Amendment Radio on my BitChute channel. Uh, he again accuses me of stealing because I use, I use Tom's work uh, to put out on the internet on the platform where he wasn't even active at that moment and uh, I didn't steal anything by the way I just took the audio that Tom did I even cut out all the advertising that was in there and I just put a few pictures together with that and put it on BitChute because I think it is a, such an important work that Tom did there with these 99 readings. Well, and, let uh, me get on the record. I'm not going to uh, get into a verbal fisticuffs with Nicholas from First Amendment Radio, but I'll tell you what, that is my work. That is my intellectual property, and I give you carte blanche permission to use my work in any way you see fit, so long as you don't edit it. And if you do, leave at least leave uh, what I said intact to make your comments. But uh, that's the only that's the only uh, that's the only uh, uh, right that I reserve is uh, just don't edit. But uh, uh, Inquisition 8 was 
was intended forever to be free. What God freely gives me, I freely give. And uh, for, for a long time, uh, Nicholas had the, the, the rights to uh, profit from it, but uh, uh, I am the owner of that work and I claim it and I give you permission. Now let's get on to this, something constructive. Yes, we are going on with the 54th reading of the wonderful book from Steve Wolberg, End Time Delusions, and we last time stranded as a few quotes on the bottom of page 132, as you can see here already in the picture. And uh, we are going to continue here this chapter, The Path of the Virus, with another quote where it says, it is a matter for deep regret that those who hold and advocate the futurist system at the present day Protestants, as they are for the most part, are thus really playing into the hands of Rome and helping to screen the papacy from detection as the Antichrist. Yeah. Now, I would like to comment on this. Yeah, sure. I, I, I give credit to Steve Wahlberg for being charitable to those who call themselves Protestants. But if you're a futurist, there's no protest. You see, we got our name Protestant because we protested the popes of Rome. That's the very foundation of Protestantism. If you, if you don't see the papacy and every pope in succession from the very first pope to the very last pope when Christ returns as the Antichrist of scripture, history, and prophecy, you cannot legitimately call yourself a Protestant. Now, there are many people in the world that call themselves Protestant, but we've just talked about the rarity of those who are historicists. Only an historicist has the right to call himself a Protestant, because only an historicist would protest the papacy as the Antichrist. A futurist may call himself a Protestant, but only in error because a futurist believes the Antichrist has not even come in the world yet. How can a Protestant protest the Antichrist when he doesn't even know who he is? That's the great error of futurism. That is the very purpose that futurism came into the world, to protect the papacy and every pope in succession from the first to the last of being the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who deceives the whole world, the one who blasphemes God. That is the Antichrist. It is the papacy. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And every pope in succession from the first to the last is the Antichrist of his day. And we protest him in every generation. We constantly protest him. We pray against him. We warn the world against him. A futurist who doesn't even believe the Antichrist is in the world has nothing to protest. So he cannot and should not call himself a Protestant. And uh, listen, Protestants, this all makes sense to the listeners now if they comprehend everything I've said so far today. Protestants are just as rare as historicists because they're one and the same. If you're not a historicist, you cannot be a Protestant. I hope that makes sense to the listeners. Now you can call yourself chicken soup. You can call yourself a, a, a watered down Catholic if you want, but you can't call yourself a Protestant. A Protestants are those who the papacy calls heretics. Protestants are the ones who the papacy launched crusades against in order to rout them out, destroy their names from history. Protestants are those who 
were tied to the stakes and burned. Protestants are those who were drugged in the streets and gutted and left for dead in the ditches and were denied even a Christian burial and their bones bleached in the sun. Protestants are the ones who are spoken of as in the Bible as the martyrs of Jesus. And by whom were they martyred? Of course, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the papacy. And who killed them? The secular powers, the governments of the world. Bible prophecy fulfilled. No one can lie to you ever again about who the Antichrist is. You have all of Scripture, all of prophecy, and all of history to attest to your truth that you know. So why would you be fearful or reticent of claiming that Protestantism is the true and the correct, the only correct interpretation of Bible prophecy. Historicism is the only truth. Now, of course, you never hear about historicism. You can hear all the time about futurism. And if those who are getting frustrated and that their futurist plans, their futurist prophecies aren't coming to pass fast enough, they'll revert to preterism but you never hear any discussion about historicism. Why? Because that's the correct interpretation of Bible prophecy. You see, futurism and historicism both successfully take the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy. It does exactly what they were intended and created to do. They deny that the papacy is the Antichrist. Preterism and futurism both accomplish the same thing. You can take your choice. You want to be a futurist? Fine. If you want to be an, a, a preterist? Fine. That takes the onus away from the Antichrist. Mission accomplished. But don't you dare, don't you dare entertain the thought of historicism because that puts the onus of Antichrist smack dab on the nose of the man of sin in Rome. You can't get it wrong. And that's why you never hear historicism preached in any church in this country or around the world. You might find a historicist here or there, but you can't make a group out of them. You can't make a denomination out of them. There's not enough of them. The rarest of the rare are historicists. Now, you want to go with the flow? You want to be a part of the wide gate? You want to be accepted and have lots of friends and fellowship? Take your choice, futurism or preterism. But don't expect to have fellowship with the man upstairs. Don't expect to have fellowship with the martyrs of Jesus. Don't expect to have fellowship with anybody but the man of sin in Rome. Historicism is the truth, the demonstrable truth, the only truth that makes sense. And uh, Steve Wahlberg knows it. Yerk knows it. I know it. A few others know it. And uh, we're going to shout it from the rooftops. Look, I've, I've nearly lost my voice preaching historicism for the last 10 years. The top of my lungs as hard as I can go. I don't know how much longer I can go. But uh, the truth will win out. Christ is my witness. And uh, I don't fear Rome. I don't fear futurists. I don't fear preterists. They're done. They've destroyed themselves. And uh, they look like a laughing stock to me. And uh, that's where I stand. Historicism. I can do none else. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. And, uh, you know, you were mentioning before our broadcast the name Caringola, and I just looked the book up. It is this book by Robert Caringola, The Historical Alternative, 70 Weeks. I own that book. I have it in my closet lying here. I never had time to read it. 
great yeah. shame on me, but you know. So yeah, many I'd things. like to have a copy of that book too. Yeah, yeah, so many things to read, but not the time to read them. I mean, I have had for the moment uh, some 20 books right on my desk and not counting all the books as PDF that I also read. So yep. excuse me for that. Uh, it is a book I will uh, advise even blindly um, because uh, Robert Caringola is a Protestant in the sense of Protestantism. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is, and uh, that brings us back to the book here, this quote number 113 that I just read to you. It is a matter for deep regret that those who hold and advocate a futurist system at the present day, Protestants as they are for the most part, which Tom just commented on, are thus really playing into the hands of Rome and helping to screen the papacy from, the detection, from detection as the Antichrist. This quote is taken from the book by Robert Caringola, uh, 70 weeks, an alternative view. And also uh, another quote, a quote with the um, footnote 111. This also comes from the same book. The proper eschatological term for the view of, uh, for the view most taught today is futurism, which fuels the confusion of dispensationalism. The futuristic school of Bible prophecy came from the Roman Catholic Church, specifically her Jesuit theologians. However, the alternative has been believed for centuries. The alternative is known as historicism. That quote also comes from Robert Caringola's book, 70 Weeks, an Alternative View, okay. as you can what? see here in the picture. Yeah? Uh, yeah. I just wanted to mention that because um, this book uh, shows, uh, with this few quotations alone, that the author damn good knows what he's talking about. And right. this book is not very widespread. You can get it via Amazon, okay, but you will see there are not many people even aware of that book. And there's next to this even another on which title I don't come right now and I don't want to get up here from my chair and uh, look into my closet because I don't have the time. We are going to do a reading here. But you see, Tom made this little remark in the beginning that someone in the latest video compared him to Elijah uh, when he thought that he was the only one who was professing God in the world and God said, no, 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 I have 7,000 Israelites spared who do not bend their knee to, na to Baal and still are worshipping me. And you see that even we didn't come to the name of Robert Caringola or we didn't come to the name of uh, Jennings and uh, Owen, uh, the two persons who wrote the book uh, that I uh, put the picture in here in the, while Tom was speaking, um, that I already deleted here. Another from the one list, uh, we again. recently discovered was, uh, was uh, the, another one that we recently discovered, you discovered, was uh, Wilcoxon. Yeah, this book here, The 70th Week of Daniel, decoded by uh, uh, David Nikao Wilcoxon. Yeah, he, he wrote two very important books of, that I am aware of so far, The 70th Week of Daniel 9, decoded, and The Olivet Discourse, decoded, which deals with uh, Matthew 24 and uh, the equivalent in Mark and Luke. Um, very, very interesting books that I can advise to read, but I haven't read the Olivet Discourse yet completely. I'm stuck at page 70 or page 80, uh, but I read the 70th week of Daniel decoded this book, this uh, book that you see here, and I can give my full advice to get that book, not per se from Amazon, because you shouldn't, you know, this is the Olivet Discourse book, uh, you should not support Amazon. You can go to the author. The author has a website and you can order it directly from his website too, especially in the United States of America. That is an easy way to do. And um, well, th those books are there and those books are, uh, let's say, advised by Tom and me. Um, but you have to understand uh, there are few of the real historicist people. And there are probably even fewer who have the whole view of historicism. And even Tom and I are learning for the moment where we have a meeting weekly with another brother of Christ in the, in the, United, in the United Kingdom. Uh, also, we see that we don't have the full understanding and we are deeply studying the subject again. Tom at his age, I at my age, 
and we really start anew for a lot of understanding, which is so important to do. And that is just one advice that I want to give everybody who watches this video and or these videos, the whole series, uh, if, if you if you want. Um, you are never done studying and you always have to put the Bible in, uh, in, in the front, the Bible in the very first place to do so and not be deceived by any man. I mean, that's what Paul preached, right? Be not deceived by any man or let no man deceive you. Or was it Jesus Christ even who said that? Let no man deceive you, you know? And how can man deceive you? Well, when he takes his Bible understanding and preaches it to you and he has a false understanding, whether he has a false understanding because he's not smart enough or he has a false understanding because, because he has another agenda. You never know. You only know yourself. You don't know anybody else. Only God knows the heart of men. We do not know. I don't know the heart of Tom, even though I'm quite sure it's a very fine heart. He doesn't know mine. And the point is... Um, we don't know that of many other people. We don't know of that of the authors. We thought the author from uh, who was working there with Richard Bennett on the website Berean Beacon, um, who wrote the book uh, All Roads Lead to Rome, Michael de Semlian, and the mm -hmm. and the following book after that, um, uh, the Pillars of uh, uh, the Foundation Under Attack, I think uh, the title was. A book Tom read, and he left out one very specific and most important word of Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse seven. And when Tom addressed him in an email on that mistake, well, Tom, if he wants to, can can go into that himself and answer for that. And otherwise, we will do that some other time. But the point is, it is very, very hard to find someone who is not only like-minded but who is in the same spirit of uh, of, of the. Uh, of the Holy Spirit as we are, or being led by the Holy Spirit as we are. It, there is so much confusion and delusion and betrayal outside in the world that I can only repeat Jesus Christ's words, let no man deceive you. And I think uh, we should really recall that every day, every day, again and again. And we can use study tools by other men, but we always have to weigh them against the Bible and we have, first and for all, to take off our church glasses. Because as long as you have the church glasses, you will never have a true biblical understanding of historicism. And, well, that's my little plea that I wanted to say, but I'm going to turn the microphone over to Tom. No, I think you've, you've handled it pretty well. Uh, we just need a, a do-over. <laughs> the churches have failed us. Uh, they're all futurist. And uh, uh, the author says the, the only alternative to futurism is historicism. I, I would take issue with that. That's the only correct alternative to uh, 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 futurism. But what is the only alternative that you're given if, you, if you're all, all of a sudden not satisfied with futurism, as many are becoming unsat dissatisfied with futurism? They resort to preterism. It, too, denies the papacy as the Antichrist. It says that the Antichrist is not in the future, as the futurists believe, but the Antichrist is way back in the, in the pagan Roman Empire, Nero or Caligula. That's the Antichrist. And that the papacy is, is the vicar of Christ bringing in the kingdom of Christ in this world. That'll make you a more staunch. Preterism will make you a more staunch papist than a futurist will. You know, when you when you when you leave futurism and you go into preterism, that's like go, get jumping out of the frying pan right into the fire. Preterism predates Christianity. Preterism says one of the ancient pagan Roman emperors was the Antichrist. It's the most cockamamie load of crap you ever heard in your life, but there's a lot of people that believe it. But what they're likely to do is to place the onus of Antichrist on one of the ancient pagan Roman Caesars and then view the papacy as Christ's replacement on earth. And that the Roman Catholic Church's business in the world is to bring in an everlasting kingdom of Christ. It'll make you a more staunch Roman Catholic than even futurism will. But the truth 
And the only alternative to futurism is historicism. And it's the only one, the only school of Bible prophecy that leaves you no option but that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. It's the only truth. It's the only correct interpretation of Bible prophecy. Now, we can get on with the book. Back to we you, should. Yep. We should, Tom. Absolutely. Yeah. I just um, use these pictures to help the people understand more the severance of the subject that we are in. So, we read um, the, fir the two quotes from Carol Garingola, which is number 111 and 113. And then we continue to read, I will emphasize a fundamental truth once more. The futurist school of Bible prophecy was created for one reason. And one reason only, yeah, to counter the Protestant Reformation. Now, leave the Protestant out and you have to counter Reformation. And that brings you back to the so often cited Council of Trent already that we spoke about so many times about because that was the Counter-Reformation Council in the 16th century. Yeah? Started by Pope Paul III, who five years before that inaugurated the Jesuit order, and then he gave the power to the Jesuit order to organize that council that ended in 1563 with 125 damnations on Protestant views of the Bible, which are historicist, biblical views of the Bible. So, I will emphasize a fundamental truth once more. The futurist school of Bible prophecy was created for one reason and one reason only, to counter the Protestant Reformation. Now, the author continues to say, Tragically, historicism has been knocked down by a powerful punch. But let me clarify something. It's not entirely out of the boxing ring. Mark Twain once said, quote, Reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated, unquote. Though not as popular as it once was, historicism lives. God's truth never dies. Well, God says that himself. He says, the earth will pass away, everything will pass away, but his word will not pass away. So have no fear. Jesus Christ burst from, uh, forth from a clammy grave, and so will solidly biblical, historical, protestant truth before earth's final harvest. When you read carefully Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through 14, and, verse, and, and uh, chapter 18, verse 1. And of course, I have taken this down from the King James Bible, and we're going to read that in a moment after I finish this little paragraph here. Nothing takes God by surprise. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And there's only one way you get knowledge, and that is by reading the scripture. The Bible says so itself. Truth will conquer all alien forces, at least inside the minds of those who are willing to see it. Now, he uses the word alien forces, and that brings us, of course, to another subject, <laughs> the quote-unquote alien agenda of the Jesuits. You can also see that everywhere you find words, you can combine this and that, and it will all leave you into some counter-Protestant Reformation theology or understanding. Now, it was a little interesting paragraph that I just read to you, starting with, have no fear. It is about the Protestant truths before Earth's final harvest. We read that carefully in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through 14. And I prepared that for you from the King James Bible, and I'm going to read it to you right now, except for Tom maybe has a comment before. 
No. So, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, all ten of them, yep. and the faith of Jesus Christ. And I think to remind the people mm -hmm. that the commandments are ten is very implicit, because yes. many people just cut a few commandments out, especially one, and then they always... Uh, you know, point to quote-unquote Seventh-day Adventists in that regard, and that is one point where they are right. If you want to keep the commandments, you have to keep them all, also the fourth. In the way that it is written in the Bible, and nowhere in the Bible is any mention that the Sabbath has been changed until Sunday. But that is another discussion, and you can watch a video of Tom and me um, from, I think, 2015. Uh, Tom, isn't it? We spoke about that, I think, yesterday. With, oh, uh, I, I don't, I don't remember, Robert. but you, 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 you're probably correct about it. Yeah. yeah. It's, I, it's a subject I've talked about many, many times. Yeah, it's, it's from the time I did these uh, recordings with Michael Adams, Nothing But The Truth, and uh, we sat down one evening for, each, for a little bit more than three hours, and uh, I named the video uh, Hour of the Truth, um, why didn't the reformers go all the way the sabbath question and that's three hours long and there you will see uh, very interesting proof of that uh, many people are deceived when they think that they keep the commandments there's always one or even more being kept out of them i mean roman catholics are told to bow down to images and idols and that's a violation of the second commandment anyway so we are in Revelation 14 here reading this, and I just want to make the point when it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. They keep all of them, and they keep the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked. And behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, we read, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Those are the verses the author advises us to read. Now, before closing this chapter, I want to share one more lesson about the virus. Only this time, we will shift gears. The lesson is not about a bad virus, but a good one. Now, I don't watch many movies, but there's one that has become an amazing parable to me. And the picture of that movie is right here on your screen. Independence Day. Released near the 4th of July in 1996, and by the way, today is the 7th of July in 2021, just a few days after the same quote-unquote Independence Day, uh, uh, 25 years after the publication of the movie. It was a 
PG-13 sci-fi thriller about a massive fleet of nasty aliens who came to Earth with a plot to take over the world on the very day of America's freedom celebration. While the alien mothership floated high above Earth's atmosphere, deadly daughter ships caused havoc across the globe. The President of the United States, his team of intelligence officers and the combined efforts of the Army, Navy and Air Force were powerless to stop the carnage. With hope fading fast, humanity's future looked bleak. Until the virus plan. Two United States citizens, one an armed forces pilot who was played by Will Smith, the other a Jewish computer expert who was played by Jeff Goldblum teamed up to carry out an almost impossible mission to save the world. The high-tech guru believed that if a certain computer virus could somehow be uploaded from his laptop into the alien mothership's master control center, this could disable its previously impenetrable protective shield. Then, pow, the US could obliterate it with a nuclear missile. The Americans had previously taken over one alien spacecraft, which the pilot said he could fly. Hoping against hope, the two Patriots took off, approached the mothership and then tricked it into momentarily letting down its defense shield, which allowed the duo to slip into its inner recesses. Upon reaching the alien core, they uploaded the virus. And it worked. With only a few seconds left to launch their own missile, time to explode shortly, and maneuver their craft out, the heroes just barely managed to escape before the mothership exploded. The daughter ships then lost their shields and were each soon blown by its to bits by other missiles launched from around the world. It all happened on the 4th of July, which became America's second Independence Day. But this time it was freedom from deadly aliens, thanks to two brave heroes and the good virus. From what I know about preterism and futurism, I can't help thinking of them as alien forces seeking to control the prophecy-minded Christian world. That's what they are. Aliens to the true meaning of scripture. As in Independence Day, these aliens are powerful and their protective shields seem impenetrable. Left behind seems like the mothership. In the light of history, the Protestant Reformation and the correct understanding of the Bible's Antichrist prophecies and this sense, oh, in this sense only, historicism is the good virus. Who is bold enough to upload the truth? Dear friend, an essential component of this good virus, the biblical truth about the Antichrist, when rightly understood, will blow both preterism and futurism into a million pieces. It may be painful, but it needs to happen for the sake of Christians everywhere. We need another Independence Day. Truth may be in the minority, but don't forget its power is limitless. In the 1500s, it started with individuals like Martin Luther. He studied the Word of God and then inserted its high voltage force into European Christianity. Through the Holy Spirit's power, Luther and his associates helped dissipate the Dark Ages. The Reformation that followed shook the world. In the 21st century, God again wants to shake the world. See Revelation 18.1, which we just read. He is looking for heroes to upload his good virus. And that, in my understanding, is a very good closing of this chapter 20, the path of the virus, before we go into chapter 21, the faith of our fathers. Now we can take a break of at least 10 minutes because I know Tom has a lot to say about what I just read. Please, brother. Yes, well, I, I didn't see the movie and uh, I probably wouldn't made the likenesses that this author has made. Um, probably not as 
as uh, creative as he is and, or imaginative. And no, but, but he just he, uses he, his he, picture he, speak, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he made his point, and uh, the point is there are two great errors that have taken over Christendom. Since the Council of Trent, preterism and futurism have become the orthodox teachings of the churches. Both are error. The Protestant Reformation has been destroyed by those two false schools of Bible prophecy interpretation. Okay? Both have the one thing in common. They deny that the papacy is the Antichrist. And there's no historicism taught in this country or the world. There are no historicist theological seminaries. There are no historicists coming into the pulpits of the churches. All we have is error. That's your choice. You can pick error number one, preterism, or error number two, futurism. Those are your only two choices. Now, if you're looking for a historicist, you're not going to find one. Not in a brick-and-mortar church. Okay? That's just the facts of life. Preterism and historicism have made a total rout of Christianity. True Christianity. Been totally uprooted. Been made totally friendly to the Roman Catholic Church and to the papacy. That was the goal from the very beginning, from the Council of Trent forward. To make Protestants Roman Catholics. And they accomplished it. If you believe preterism or futurism, you're a friend of the Pope. The Pope has but one enemy in the world. That's the truth. The grand liar of Scripture, history, and prophecy has but one enemy. That is the truth. And the truth is historicism. And that's why historicism has never been given as an option for you to pick from. You can't go down the street in any neighborhood, in any city, in this country or around the world. Well, there's a Roman Catholic church. There's a preterist church. There's a futurist church. But there is no historicist church. They don't exist. You got to make one. And that's my advice to everyone that's listening. Now, whether you meet in the catacombs or the sewers or in your basements, my recommendation is when Rome is so all powerful in this world, don't intend to make a huge congregation because you're going to draw attention. The Bible gives us the hint how we are to survive in a Roman Catholic world. The Bible says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst. And that's how the churches start. That's how the truth will get a start in this country, by two or three at a time. Invite more than that. You're going to draw attention, and most likely, most likely, you're going to invite a futurist or a preterist to join your congregation, and he will rat you out to the papist authorities. Does that make sense to anybody? There's a reason why their historicism is not even given as a choice in this world. It's been outlawed by the man of sin in Rome. The papacy would never give you an option to believe the truth. 
the seminaries of this country would never give you the option to believe the truth. Oh, there are all kinds of seminaries for preterists and futurists, none for historicists. Now, if anybody knows the Bible and the history of, of, of Bible prophecy fulfillment, just by these facts alone, you can pick the truth. It's not given as an option. It's not even given as an option. Still yet more confirmation undeniable confirmation that historicism is the truth. Historicism was the only school of Bible prophecy interpretation prior to about 1805 or 1810 in England. Anybody who had a Bible, who had the ability to read and understand that Bible, was a historicist in his understanding. And what did they unanimously agree on? The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. Up until 1805 or 1810, historicism was the only school of Bible prophecy interpretation. You couldn't get it wrong. There were no preterist option. There were no futurist option. There was only the truth. I'm sure you're all going to find that very difficult to believe until you start reading Protestant works. And that's why Yerk and I read good, reputable Protestant works. Good, reputable Protestant history. And the, the, the answer is obvious. They were all historicists in their interpretation of Bible prophecy. They all got it right. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. Now, the question is always asked me, Tom, how could you be right and everybody else is wrong? Let me just turn that right around on the naysayers and say, how could any everybody prior to 1805 have it right? And then we, in our generation, preach the opposite and claim to be right. What is taught in the churches what is taught in the seminaries of the uh, theological seminaries today is exactly the opposite of what every Christian believed prior to about 1800 AD. Now ask the question, how could Christians today be right and all those generations of Christians prior to 1800 AD be wrong? That's the question we ought to all be asking. That is the question we ought to all be asking. There was a tremendous, an irreplaceable benefit of reading and studying Protestant eschatology. And that was the realization, the unavoidable realization, that during the Protestant days, prior to uh, the Protestant Reformation, all the way back to the first century church, there was only one school of Bible prophecy interpretation. You couldn't get it wrong. It was historicism. Preterism and futurism, which have become the orthodox teaching in our apostate generation, was never even an option. during the lion's share of the Christian era. These lies are the newest deceptions on the block. They're not even dry behind the ear yet, if you understand my meaning. They are infantile, brand new. I think we ought to return to the old paths and do it forthwith and unapologetically, and sooner the better, and start over with Christ. Repudiate this ecumenical movement to unite all the Protestant churches back into the Roman Catholic Church. That is the result of futurism and preterism. 
the ecumenical movement is the very result of preterism and futurism. That's proof positive that futurism and preterism are Roman Catholic eschatology. And that's also why historicism is not even given as a choice in this world. You can't get it wrong when you're a historicist. Now, do you have the courage to stand against family, friends, your town, your churches? Do you have the courage, the intestinal, spiritual fortitude to stand up for the truth in front of the whole world of, of, of futurists and preterists? If you don't have the intestinal spiritual fortitude, you might well be wasting your time. But I'd have to ask if you're a historicist in your understanding, why would you fear anything? I think it's time for God's people to stand up. I think it's time for the truth to displace all of the error, all of the futurist and preterist error, all of the Roman Catholic Jesuit counter-reformation error, all of the Council of Trent counter-reformation error. It's time for God's people to stand up against the Jesuit error and return to true biblical Protestantism. Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist, and you can only come to that conclusion if you're a historicist in your understanding. I don't know how to say it any other way. I've said it in as many ways as I can describe it. And it makes sense, doesn't it? You can't deny it, can you? As much as you would hope that I'm wrong, you can't deny that it's absolutely correct. The President that, de Joya's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, but both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr. Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... I call you to order and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this house. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city.
Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist, a reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. He remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. But let me say this, if the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ in this group. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage. 